Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. For today's video, we are reading through John chapter 10. I am so excited to read through John 10 because it is one of my favorite chapters of the book of John. And I feel like I say that about a lot of the chapters, but I love chapter 10 because it's such a good metaphor of Jesus and the church and the good shepherd and his sheep. And it's just such a sweet, sweet chapter. So I'm excited to read along with you guys. So if you want to take out your Bible, I also have my commentary that I'll link down below. We can go ahead and get started. Okay, so starting in John chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. So here, after chapter 9, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees directly, and I highlighted um, in verse 1, by the gate, because this tells me that there is a specific proper and right way to enter into the sheep pen and if it's by any other way then it's a thief or a robber there is one right way to enter in and then in verse 2 he says the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And what stuck out to me about verse three is when it says the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and I underlined by name because Jesus knows each one of us individually by name. He loves us so he knows us deeply. It says he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. I also underline leads. And then verse four, when he has brought out all his own, also underlined his own because we are his, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And wow, I just think verse three and four paint such a beautiful picture of what our relationship with Jesus is supposed to look like as the good shepherd and his sheep. One thing that if you guys have time to do is just look up pictures of a shepherd leading sheep. I think having a picture of that is so great to visualize when reading this chapter. But in verse four, I also underline when it says he goes on ahead of them. That's so comforting to me knowing that Jesus goes on ahead of me in everything that I do. He's already there. He already knows what's happened. All the days are already written. He knows exactly how my life is going to turn out where it's supposed to go he goes ahead of his sheep and also I underlined his sheep follow him because they know his voice and I underlined they know his voice as followers of Jesus there's a knowing in us we know his voice we can know and recognize the things of God the word of God what comes from God and we follow that because we know his voice in verse 5 but they will never follow a stranger in fact they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice and what's so cool about this is if you do some research about sheep they actually recognize their shepherd's voice they recognize human voices and know who to follow they recognize them as their leader their shepherd and will follow that voice and in verse 6 Jesus used this figure of speech but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them which isn't the first time that they don't quite understand like the broader sense or spiritual sense and metaphor parables that Jesus is speaking in. in verse 7 therefore Jesus said again very truly I tell you I am the gate for the sheep and I highlighted I am the gate for the sheep because if you go back to verse 1 where it says whoever does not enter the sheep pen by the gate or by this specific right way is not the shepherd but Jesus says I am the gate for the sheep. Jesus is the way to enter. And then verse 8, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. And I highlighted that first section of verse 9 where it says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved because that is such good news that Jesus is the gate and that we will be saved. And then in verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And I highlighted that as well. I feel like I'm highlighting all the verses here because it's just... It's just so good. In verse 10, the thief that Jesus is referring to, he also mentions in verse one, where they enter in the sheep pen by some other way, not through him. They are a thief and a robber. So the thief in this verse could be referring to false teachers, corrupt leaders, 
or just any evil spirit. And it says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And then in contrast, it says that Jesus has come so that they may have life and have it to the full. And I underlined that we may have life and have life to the full. That's such wonderful news that when we accept Jesus into our hearts, we can live life to the fullest. God is a God of abundance and he wants to bless us. And we can have our fullest life, our live our best life with Jesus when we have Jesus in our hearts. And I can attest to that. Like I am living my best life when I follow Jesus, when I'm walking in purpose, when I'm walking in step with the spirit. It's not always easy and it's not always pretty, but the life that I have with Jesus, oh, it's so, so good and it's so fulfilling. I just think that's so encouraging that Jesus came so that we can have life and not only have life, but have it to the full. And then in verse 11, Jesus continues, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And you already know I highlighted that as well, that he lays down his life for us, for his sheep. And in verse 12, the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So here Jesus is continuing to contrast him being the good shepherd and then others that are not the shepherd. Others that may be false teachers or corrupt leaders or people who just are not true shepherds. They don't truly care about the sheep. They might be after money, power, whatever it may be. They don't actually care for the sheep, but in contrast, Jesus is the good shepherd. He knows us. He, it says he calls us by name in verse 3. We are his own in verse 4. We know his voice and he lays down his life for us. That is how intimate the relationship is between Jesus and us. And then in verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He emphasizes that again, that he is the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And I highlighted that too because <laughs> it's just like this This chapter is just so sweet. It's just full of these little love notes from God about how much Jesus loves us. He is the good shepherd and he knows us. When you think about that, like you can't be truly loved unless you are fully known. And how amazing is it that the creator of the universe knows each of us in our hearts intimately individually i just felt so close to him after reading that verse that i know my sheep and my sheep know me in verse 15 just as the father knows me and i know the father and i lay down my life for the sheep and i highlighted that again because he's the ultimate good shepherd he lays down his life for the sheep and then in verse 16 i have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen i must bring them also they too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So in verse 16, Jesus is referring to the Gentiles or people who are outside who don't know him yet that he must also bring in because they are his. I highlighted in pink when he says, I must bring them also because it just shows that Jesus cares about every one of his sheep. I must bring them also. And I also highlighted there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And I just think that brings such a good picture or visual of how we should all be one flock, one body of Christ under one shepherd, Jesus. And then verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again this command I received from my father. So this is kind of foreshadowing what is to come when he lays down his life and takes it up again. And one thing that stuck out to me is in verse 18 where it says, but I lay it down of my own accord, of his own accord. So this was a choice. Jesus made a choice to lay down his life and to choose you, to choose me. That was a choice that he made. So if you guys are ever feeling some type of way of like not good enough, not loved, not this, not that, know that you were chosen by the son of God. He chose to lay down his life for you of his own accord. So you are chosen and so, so loved and known by him. 
Uh, I told you guys I just love this chapter. I've been highlighting every verse because it is truly just a love letter to you and I about how Jesus views us as his sheep. And then in verse 19, the Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So here again, just as in the last chapter, a lot of people feel all sorts of ways and are very divided about who Jesus is. Some think he's demon possessed and mad because no one's spoken like him before, but on the other hand, no one's also performed the signs and miracles and spoken with so much truth and love as him either. They even say in verse 21, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Because back in chapter nine, Jesus healed a man born blind. So there's just a lot of conflict about who Jesus is at this time. And then in verse 22, then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. So Jesus is saying here, like I've already told you, exactly who I am. And he's told them many times before, but they just don't believe even though they've seen so many signs. And in verse 27, he continues, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So a few things I underline in verse 27 is my sheep listen to my voice. As followers of Jesus, we know his voice and we listen to his voice. We are able to recognize it and follow him. And I also underlined, I know them and they follow me. And verse 28 is also another one of my favorite verses of this chapter where it says, Jesus gives us eternal life. We will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch us out of his hand. And how comforting is that, that once we are his, we are his. There's nothing that can take us away from him. In verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. And again, so much comfort in verse 29 when it says that God, the father is greater than all. No one is stronger than God. No one is greater than God. God is greater than all and nothing, no one can snatch us out of his hand. When I read that, I just feel like an immense feeling of safety and security. Nothing can snatch you out of God's hand. Nothing is that powerful. Nothing's greater than him, including yourself, that there's nothing you can do either that can snatch you out of God's hand. And in verse 30, Jesus says, I and the father are one. And so here it's also very clear, Jesus and God are one. That is what he's claiming and they're one and the same. And of course, when he says that, the Jewish leaders are not very happy. In verse 31, it says, again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, and claiming to be one with God, that obviously upset these Pharisees, and they tried to stone him because they're claiming that he's blaspheming. But then in verse 34, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? So here in my commentary, it says Jesus is referring to the judges of Psalm 82. They were called gods with lowercase g because in their office, they determined the fate of other men. So Jesus is more reasoning. If God gave these unjust judges the title gods because of their office, why do you consider it blasphemy that I call myself the son of God in light of the testimony of me and my works? So if any sense, the judges could be called gods with little g, then how much more can Jesus, the actual son of God, whom God himself sent, should be called God? So he's kind of just reasoning with them in that way. And I highlighted in verse 36 where it says, the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world. 
God sent Jesus, his very own son, into the world to save us and he set him apart in that way and then in verse 37 do not believe me unless i do the works of my father but if i do them even though you do not believe me believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and i in the father so here jesus is saying i know you guys don't believe in me but even if you don't believe in me look at what i've done the works should also speak volumes the works that I've done, including healing the blind, could only be done by the Son of God. And that's why he says that even just looking at that, you can understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. But then in verse 39, again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. And I highlight that he escaped their grasp because I think it's so cool how many times, because it was not his time yet, how many times Jesus has gotten away from these people. And then in verse 40, then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. So even though here there's a lot of opposition from the Pharisees just doubting who Jesus is, there were still a lot of people that were coming to Jesus who were believing in him. So even though some people thought he was crazy, God was also still at work in bringing other people to him. So that concludes John chapter 10, truly one of my favorite chapters of the book of John. It's just such a sweet, sweet chapter. A few key takeaways I had and just what really stuck out to me about the way Jesus calls us his sheep and the way Jesus loves us is when it says in verse three, he knows us by name. He calls his sheep by name and he also leads us out. He also calls us his own in verse four and he goes ahead of us and we follow him and we know his voice. And in verse seven, Jesus is the gate for the sheep. In verse nine, whoever enters through me will be saved. And I love verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus also says he is the good shepherd, the good shepherd. He lays his life down for the sheep. In verse 14, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. In verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. In verse 16, I must bring them also. He's talking about all the other sheep from all over the world that he is calling to him. And in verse 18, he laid down his life for us. He laid down his life for us of his own accord, of his own will and his own choice because he loves you and I that much. If you're ever questioning your worth, go back to this chapter. Know how loved and known and worthy and chosen you are. Jesus loves us so much and in him we can truly have life to the full. So those are just some of my key takeaways, but I just love this chapter so, so much. It's very dear to my heart. And thank you guys so much for reading along with me. John chapter 11 will be next. As always, I hope that you guys have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week, just knowing how loved and chosen and how known that you are. I will see you all in my next video. Bye.